Greetings, everyone. It's so good to be back at AGRF, even via video. And it's good to be in such great company with Strav Masiwa, a mentor of mine, a living legend, a former chair of Agra, and a partner to all of you that are attending today. We're excited to speak to you today and to introduce a new friend, Per Hegenis of the IKEA Foundation, the CEO of the IKEA Foundation. And we're going to answer some questions about a major new effort to improve access to reliable, renewable energy and how better access to energy can really impact and improve the prospects for agriculture and food throughout Africa. Well, you know, due to COVID-19's extraordinary impacts around the world, it's very clear that many, many economies, especially economies in Africa, face the threat of slower growth in the next decade without major new investments in re-energizing the agriculture sector and improving access to electrification throughout the economy. It's so clear through COVID that we live in a digital world uh, that we live in a new global economy. And frankly, as countries uh, access vaccines, something Strive is really making happen throughout the continent. Uh, and as they look to spend more domestic resources on a real green recovery, it's absolutely essential that electrification reaches the sectors that create the most employment and the most productive uh, engagement with their population. The agriculture sector is critical to that uh, as are others. And we very much advocate for and hope that new efforts to bring renewable energy to farmers will help those farmers improve their productivity, will help them reach markets, will help processors uh, deliver product and benefit from the value added, and will help consumers access healthy and nutritious food at a time when that's critically needed. Strive, you've worked on this issue uh, through your private enterprises as well as as an extraordinary public servant on behalf of the continent, what are your thoughts on how renewable energy in particular can help improve the status of agriculture across Africa? Well, well, Raj, first of all, it's, it's great to be with you again. You know, many people don't know that it is 20, virtually 20 years since you and I started working together when you were at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and I was uh, on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation and uh, with Judith and we, we came over to see you guys to discuss how the two great foundations could come together to tackle the issue of agriculture. And of course, you've done full circle. You went to government after that uh, you went and ran USAID and came to, to Rockefeller Foundation. And so, you know, your commitment to these issues have been consistent for the last 20 years with the same passions towards Africa that uh, you had all those 20 years ago, except you, you've you kept your hair and I lost mine, Raj. I don't know what happened. But anyway, you know, coming to the issue of renewable energy, you know, in those 20 years, Raj, I, it's become clear to me, as we say in Africa, that there was an elephant in the room that was a, a, a stumbling block to anything we could really serious do on the development side, of which agriculture is foundational. But that is energy. We, you know, the, the amount of energy an American consumes boiling a cup of tea is what a farmer in Tanzania uses in a year. Just think about that, Raj. Okay, so how can we have equitable development without addressing the issue of energy? Now, the issue of energy has for a long time, like a lot of things in Africa, been an issue of resources. 
just the cost of delivering power to the rural poor, the majority of whom are farmers, has been prohibitive. But you and I, um, you recall a couple of years ago, the two of us went off on one of our fact-finding missions, and we ended up uh, in Chicago. To, to, I'm sure you forgot. You remember that journey. And we were, we were on an intellectual search, Raj, if you recall. How do we solve the problem of power? And, and we knew then that something was happening in the renewable space. Uh, which could offer us a glimmer of hope. This situation, we could deal with storage, if we could deal with the cost of storage, and we could do, deal with the cost of solar panels, uh, we could perhaps deliver a solution. And I believe that renewables, as we stand today, are on the cusp of delivering to the rural populace of Africa. Finally, 21st century energy. Well, you know, global alliances are, uh, are needed to solve so many of the pressing challenges of our time. Stride mentioned the Green Revolution 50 years ago. That was effectively a global alliance between scientists and governments and uh, farmers and, and seed companies. Uh, AGRA, which is the heart and soul in many respects of this forum, is a global alliance of all of those partners and so many more, civil society activists and, and uh, gender activists as well, which is absolutely essential and necessary. A global alliance is simply a way to come together and say, let's work as partners. Let's find those companies, those entrepreneurs that have the technologies and the business models to reach uh, hundreds of millions of people with new solutions. Let's bring them to the table. Let's find uh, the farmers themselves and, and the customers who on the other end will be the consumers of, of renewable electricity that currently don't have access to power. And let's talk to them and learn from them and make sure their voice is prominent in the structuring of new partnerships and collaborations. And let's get governments and, and private industry and banks and capital markets to do their share because we know that it will take everyone to solve this kind of challenge. I, I will say Strive is doing exactly that right now and bringing hundreds of millions of doses of vaccines to uh, the African continent and African people. He's had a track record, you have Strive, of doing exactly this kind of collaboration. And this is what we need right now. Agra needs it. Africa's farmers need it. You point out the technology is there. Some of your companies are leading the way in this space in terms of uh, renewable electrification for often off-grid customers. And, and this is a movement that much like the microfinance movement, you know, decades ago with Dr. Yunus, needs to really reach those who are currently excluded by the global economy, those who are excluded by modern agricultural systems, those who are excluded uh, by the, you know, green recovery that will take hold in some parts of the world, but not all of the uh, global population unless we put some real effort into it. So. This year, there's a COP meeting where the climate leadership will come together and see what the world can do to fight climate change. Africa must have a voice and a presence in that. And in fact, much like you built mobile infrastructure years ago, now is the time to build a new energy infrastructure so Africa can leapfrog and show the way to a new, uh, a new digital economy that's, that is the future and should be powered by a future set of technologies that reach absolutely everybody. You know, as, um, as I said at the beginning, I, I first met Raj nearly 20 years ago, uh, and we were the group charged by the leadership of, um, of the of Rockefeller Foundation's board and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to put together AGRA. 
that's how far back I first time met, met Raj was to discuss what is Agra. And I remember even debating its name with, uh, with Raj. And you know that the first word in that name is alliance. We, we knew that problems today, real problems today, can only be solved by global alliances. Leadership today is synonymous with the ability to build alliances. And you have to we have to measure our leaders going forward now in their ability to solve problems through alliance. We will not solve the climate change, an existential threat, the first real existential threat since the nuclear threat is the climate change. Well, it requires an alliance. There will be at the end of this century, 40% of the world's population will be Africans. You, so you can't solve any problem without them in the room. You, you can't solve the climate problem without them because they will be both victims and will also be uh, participating in the problem. So what we know is this. If you want to lead, you must learn to work in an alliance with others. You've got to work at community level in alliance. You've got to work at national level in alliance. You have to learn to reach out to people you don't agree with. Because you won't solve problems without finding ways to reach. The Americans have this expression, reaching out across the aisle. You know, the aisle is only ever one meter. Do you know an aisle in a church which is more than one meter? You know, it's not far. Just it's, it's an arm's length to reach out to another person. Okay? This issue of the energy for the people of Africa, what we learned in, in Agra as, as I progressed working with Raj and others was that it's about livelihoods. We, we, we've got to think in terms of livelihoods of people. Agriculture is not a standalone farming issue. It's about the livelihoods of those people, the quality of life of those people. Because if we don't improve the quality of lives of people, they will abandon the land. They will end in the slums. But if our, then who is the steward of the environment? It's got to be people. We've got to stop people hacking trees for charcoal. If you think trees are being torn down now, animals are being destroyed now, imagine what it will be like when our population moves to from 1.3 billion to 4 billion. Okay, so you need us as Africans to be part and parcel of the solution. And we shall do it in an alliance, all of us. So that's why we call it Agra, Alliance for a Green Revolution. So we need an energy revolution too. Maybe you should form an alliance for an energy revolution in Africa. I'm for that. But I think we can also do it with Agra. <laughs> well, I agree, Strive. You, you uh, mentioned uh, an, a common American saying about re reaching out across the aisle. You taught me uh, many years ago an African saying, which was, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. And I think uh, you've exhibited that in all of your work over these couple of decades uh, and more. And we look forward to continuing to partner with Agra and all of its stakeholders to take this vision forward to bring electrification to African agriculture uh, this year and, and in the years to come. Great. No, thanks, Raj. Let's do it. Let's do Let's it. Let's get this done. I've still got a bit of hair on the sides, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, we're going to have to work on that.
<laughs> Thank you. I now would like to introduce Per Hagenis of the IKEA Foundation uh, to speak to you about this incredible challenge. Hello, everyone. Thank you for allowing us to share our view on the challenges and, more importantly, opportunities ahead of us to build back better, especially for the agricultural sector. The science is clear and recently confirmed by the IPCC report. We only have 10 years to get the switch from fossil fuels to renewables right. We have the technology and the investors. We now need to design, develop and implement more aligned and efficient funding programs backed by the political leadership. Country programs and private sector initiatives need to join forces to cut carbon today and stop our reliance on fossil fuels for tomorrow. To facilitate and drive this collaboration, the IKEA Foundation and Rockefeller Foundation have joined forces to set up a historic one billion initiative to catalyze investments in distributed renewable energy. It's our mission to reduce greenhouse gas emissions quickly and significantly by increasing the use of renewable energy such as solar and reducing reliance on fossil fuels. Let me give you an example on how we can do this. If you are able to replace diesel generators and coal-fired grids with renewable and alternatives, we can achieve double impact. We can cut greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuels now and prevent a further increase in the future. By leading an accelerated transition to renewable energy, we can potentially reduce 1 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions and improve 1 billion lives in countries that need it most. In Africa, we see a lot of near-term opportunities in countries such as Ethiopia, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. In markets including Malawi, Rwanda, and Uganda, and the Sahel G5 have a lot of potential too. Agriculture plays a central role in the lives of millions of people in Africa. Providing access to renewable energy can be a pathway to a more sustainable future for farming communities. I probably don't need to convince you why this is so important. The facts speak for themselves. More than 60% of the population in Sub-Saharan Africa are smallholder farmers, and about 23% of Sub-Saharan Africa's GDP comes from agriculture. In East Africa, this is, equates to about 25% of GDP. Smallholder farmers in Africa have the lowest yields and incomes globally and also suffer severe losses due to adverse weather effects as a result of climate change. A disproportionate number of people in rural areas live in extreme poverty. Smallholder farmers often lack access to basic services and products like finance, savings, markets, and last but not least, energy. So the evidence of our projects implementing renewable energy in African agriculture show that there are huge opportunities to support both economic growth and reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. We can achieve this by focusing on programs and actions that drive the productive use of renewable energy. Think, for example, of solar energy powered cooling, storing, preserving, drying, processing, and electric transporting. These examples show how reliable solar-powered energy can unlock agriculture's potential to drive rural development and contribute to climate change mitigation by substituting renewable energy for fossil fuels. This transformation will, on average, reduce carbon emissions by 50-60% and increase income by 20-50%. Imagine what this means for the lives of so many people, families and children who now live in poverty. So we invite governments, DFIs and the private sector to join us in our collective ambitions. Whether you are working at community, national or global level, in government, in business, finance or philanthropy, this is the moment we all need to come together, show leadership and commit to urgent action. We have a window of opportunity to tackle the climate crisis and by doing so we can positively impact the lives of millions of farmers, communities and drive economic developments. The time to act is now.